well, first of all, I just love skiing. Like, so much. There's nothing in the world that brings me more joy, ever. Yeah, I'm scared to death right now, but I've got this. Like, I know deep down inside, I'm capable of what I'm about to do. I came back way stronger. I felt like the rehab was pretty simple and straightforward and I learned how to appreciate my body and how to take care of it, what to eat and like to stretch. I was 18, so I felt like I was invincible at the time. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Athletic Stance Podcast, a skier's perspective with your host, Yours truly, Scott Chrisman. In this podcast, I have made it my job to go out and interview skiers at the highest level of the sport, to explore their perspective on life, what shaped and influenced them to become the person they are, and a whole lot more. First, let's take a look at our sponsors, because without them, none of this is possible. Our first sponsor is Grass Sticks. I love these poles. Not only are they sustainable, they're handmade in Steamboat, Colorado, and by far the most durable and best pole I've ever used. I used to break a couple pair of aluminum poles a season. I haven't broke a pair in two and a half years now, so if that doesn't speak to the quality, I don't know what does. Use the code REP5 for 15% off a new set of sticks. Our second sponsor is IFA Pro Wear. They make sustainable bamboo underlayers that are not only the most comfortable underlayers I've ever used, but antimicrobial. So they keep from smelling bad and they're wicking so it'll keep you dry. Check out their website ifa-prowear.com and use the code AOS17 for 15% off any purchases. They just came out with an underwear line that is super comfortable. I recommend you check it out. next guest is an incredibly talented big mountain skier. I was lucky enough to grow up ski racing with this woman. Even back then, she was a complete badass, and you could tell she had a huge future in the sport. Uh, Not only is she an amazing skier, she's an amazing person, she's very mindful, she is very confident, and an amazing role model for young women everywhere in the ski industry. Without further ado, let's check out Angel Collinson. Um, Yeah, so my name's Angel Collinson and I am now a professional big mountain skier and I grew up um, up at Snowbird Ski Resort in the employee housing. And now I just recently moved up to Alaska and that's been amazing. But uh, my background in skiing was, you know, growing up shredding Snowbird every day in the winter living up there. Um, But I started ski racing when I was eight and I ski raced until I was like 18 or 19. And so that's the majority of kind of my skiing background. And then I transitioned into big mountain skiing when I didn't make the U S ski team when I was 18 and went to college and took up an academic scholarship and just entered a couple of big mountain comps for fun. And then that snowballed pretty quick and the rest is history. And now here I am making a full on career out out of it, which I never <laughs> expected at all. <laughs> so yeah. So awesome. How's uh, Alaska treating you? That was a huge move in your life. I feel like you've <laughs> been in Salt Lake your whole life, pretty much, or you know, yeah. snowbird. So, yeah. Um, what was that like, and what spurred that decision? And you know, how's it like? How's it been working out for you? Yeah, it's been amazing. It's still, 
you know, it's pretty recent. I moved up there in June, so I haven't spent a winter up there. But the the hardest thing I think is that I travel so much, uh, and maybe this will make the winters there a lot more bearable and not a big deal. But in the summers, I wanted to be there a lot more than I was. But that's kind of part of the lifestyle, and it's a blessing and a curse of you know what we get to do as pro skiers and as like sponsored athletes is. We get to travel the world and see all these amazing places, but we also never, it's really challenging to be home. So I haven't really spent as much time in Alaska this summer as I would like, but yeah, it was a huge move because I pretty much never left the confines of little Cottonwood Canyon, <laughs> like grew up in Snowbridge and then like built a house with my bro and lived there just at the mouth of the canyon for another six years or whatever. So it's pretty funny. My parents were like, well, this is pretty typical of you to be like, not move, not move. And then like for my first move ever, pick a place that's like so as far away as you can get pretty much, at least in the U.S. So yeah, it was good. It felt good to just like commit and go for it. And I knew wholeheartedly that it was the right thing. So yeah, it was big, but it felt right. And I guess uh, what spurred it was I just was feeling like uh, I wasn't, I was kind of stuck in a rut in Salt Lake. And it was an amazing time, like the past four years where I made these um, friends, you know, kind of from the Burning Man scene, but just artists and musicians. Um, And so my ski life and then my personal, like my career life and my personal life were like super separate. And I really loved that. I kind of loved the ability to step out of one world and be completely immersed in a different one that was fulfilling for so many, in so many other ways. But I also found that that meant any time away from work and all of my free time was spent doing like social things and not getting outside and not being active. And I kind of felt like it was starting to take away from my career and what I want to do in my career. And I also just miss spending um, a lot of time in mother nature. So I kind of used it as a opportunity to reprioritize my life and spend more time outside. Definitely. Awesome. All that sounds awesome. Um, what made it feel so right or like how, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, can like easily second guess decisions. And I think that that's a a decision that could be easily, like you could sit on the fence for the rest of your life if you wanted to. (laughs) So what made it feel right? Or like, how could you tell that it was the right move for you? Uh, well, it's funny because I, um, I guess part of knowing when things are right is having like a conscious practice of like paying attention or being self-aware and also being aware of like the flow of life, you know, and it kind of takes like an everyday, um, everyday practice where you're like, where you're constantly checking in with yourself and checking in with life, you know? And so Sometimes it's, you know, when you're traveling or whatever, like it's natural that you get ungrounded and you're kind of like, there's like static in your head and you're just going through the motions. But the more that I think you can like ground down and, and be present, then when you can notice the flow of life and when certain like turns of events come, you know what they mean or you feel their motivation in your life. And you're like, okay, this, this is the right thing. You know, instead of being like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I should stay or go. You're kind of like, no, I've been paying attention and I can feel that this is, this is part of that flow. And so I knew that I wanted to leave Salt Lake and I pretty much figured it was going to be this June. I just didn't know where, but one of my stipulations was that I really wanted to be by the ocean or at least by water. And, um, then when I was rehabbing my knee in December in Hawaii and kind of thinking about my next moves and life and stuff like that and I was like, maybe I should just buy a place in Hawaii. I travel so much that the rare time that I'm home, it'd be pretty sick to be in Hawaii, you know? Yeah, totally. And then, yeah, so I was like, you know, just kind of trying to like open the p- doors of possibility in my own brain because I feel like so often we we set our own limitations, you know, just on what we think is possible versus what actually is. And so yeah. I met my boyfriend down there who was also rehabbing his knee. And there was just a lot of sort of things where you're just like, well, this just – seems like it was in the stars and seems like it was just obvious. And with how the relationship progressed and also the lifestyle that he led in Alaska. And I've always been super drawn to Alaska, not just from skiing, but since I was a little girl, like all my favorite books are on like the Alaskan animals and stuff like that. So 
it was kind of, I guess, just a matter of like constantly trying to pay attention and then knowing that it just felt right, I guess. Totally. Um, you talked about being grounded. Is there like, um, when I interviewed Dane uh, a couple days ago, we talked about how breathing really mm-hmm. brings, you know, a centered awareness. Um, I assume that, you know, conscious breathing is a part of grounding for you. Is there anything else physiologically that you do like to get yourself to relax and to like find your quote unquote true center? Yeah. Um, I would say that's like the majority of my existence is in, like, that's like at the, one of the more utmost of important things in my life. But, you know, at the same time, I also get distracted from it, but really on, I meditate pretty much on a daily basis. Sometimes I'll skip days if I have to wake up at like 4am and I find I, if I don't do it, my grounding practice in the morning, it's hard for me to do it at all, but that's just how I work. But yeah, for me, breathing is really a big thing. Um, chakra work really resonates with me. And so I do a lot of different like chakra visualizations, meditations where in, com- in combination with breath work. And so I really like to start out my practice or whatever. Like I always travel with like a little piece of Palo Santo, which yep. is holy wood. And so it acts like sage or whatever, where you light it and it, the smoke clears away the space and negative energies. And for me, just having that ritual where you're like, okay, I'm going to set aside this time. I'm going to have this ritual of lighting the Palo Santo. And it helps me get into that practice. I think rituals are so important for us because when you practice them time and time again, you know, things get easier to slip into that mind state of grounding of relaxation. And I feel like the more frequently you do it, the easier it is. So yeah, breath works big visualization is big. And then I usually try and have some sort of like candle or wood or something to help me like my other senses, like smell become integrated too, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Um, speaking of chakra work meditation, uh, maybe kind of a side note, have you ever done, uh, an Ananda mandala meditation? No. Um, I'll have to send it over to you after. Yeah, it's please do. Amazing. It's like a thirty, about thirty minute meditation, and it's to reset your chakras. Perfect. And it's like a, it's almost like a forced hyperventilation. You're breathing mm-hmm. just through your nose, and you're taking mm-hmm. these huge breaths, as slow mm-hmm. and as full in, and then out super fast. So you end up over oxygenating your body. Yeah. Like my hands will kind of go numb. Sometimes yep. my hands kind of start to float. And yeah. <laughs> like I've, I have hallucinated the most I've ever hallucinated before Yeah, off of this meditation. Yeah. Um, Sick. so I'll have to send it over to you. Um, have, are you familiar with Wim Hof? Yes, totally. Yeah. So it's like his, his breathing techniques. I wish I practiced more regularly for some reason. I find that it's like a, a lot to commit to. I don't know why. Um, but I, that's what I've experienced with his stuff. And every time it comes back into my like realm of awareness, like that kind of breath work or, you know, oversaturating your blood with oxygen. It's so powerful. It's crazy. So thanks for bringing it up. I would love to check it out. Yeah, definitely. And I'll probably include that in the show notes if it makes it into the, the show. And if anyone else you know, ends up doing it. Yeah, it. why not? I think you should. Hear about that for sure. Yeah. Um, and I'd love to hear about your experience once you do it. It's like one of the most incredible things last, it was like a year ago, I was having a little bit of trouble with like residual concussions that I had had uh-huh. and, um, just like feeling depressed and down and like, just like, I was feeling like my brain wasn't working. I was like, uh-huh. I felt like my brain was stopping to work and, uh, I got recommended this meditation and I've started to do it pretty much every Sunday for almost the last year and like Uh so many things have changed in my world so so many things have changed so yeah cool I like that every Sunday too because I do feel like that kind of work is like pretty too too much to do every day so I like the like once a week thing that's a great idea yeah and I do it like I generally try and like set a plan out for my week on Sunday and you know Sunday is just kind of like my day that I get organized, I do laundry and I get, Mm -hmm. you know, my schedule down and then I get my body together with the meditation and my body, my mind and, you know, everything. And, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll definitely have to send that over to you for sure. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. 
Um, while we're talking about like rituals and routines and stuff like that, do you have a specific morning routine that you follow generally? Like I know for us it's hard traveling all the time and like you know you wake up at like six one day and then you know you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning that day and then you sleep in or you know yeah so, um morning routines i think you know like in the business world and in, in the entrepreneurial world everyone's all about morning routines and setting your day mm -hmm. off right and i think mm -hmm. um yeah do you have anything like that or yeah. Well, like you touched on, that's the hardest thing about the travel is that it really disrupts your routines. And so for me, finding um, a easy, simple one that I can pretty much do at whatever time and that doesn't take too long. Mornings are my favorite time. They're when I'm the most productive. Um, so it's hard for me because I always want to carve out some time to get grounded and to not be thinking about the to-do list or emails. But then I, I find if it's too long, then I lose my motivation, right? So it's like this constant battle of like the right amount of time for, for the right ritual things. But um, like I said, I uh, the Palo Santo, like lighting the Palo Santo and just having at least five minutes where I'm just like not thinking about what I have to do, but just kind of focusing on my breath or focusing on my breathing or sometimes letting thoughts come up and seeing, um, what's emotionally difficult for me at that time. I like to do, um, cause sometimes it's impossible to just sh shut your brain off. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, I, the Palo Santo breath work visualization, I really try and do every morning. Also, um, I really like starting my mornings off with a cup of lemon water. So I try and travel with lemons because that's like the one thing if I can get like a big tall glass of lemon water, I feel so much more awake and clear and just like present. So those are the two things that I try to do no matter what. Okay. Um, yeah. And then if I, depending on where I'm at, if I have more time, um, I like to try and write like three pages in a journal, like stream of consciousness and see what comes up. Um, I've read, I don't know if you've heard of the book, The Artist's Way. But, um, it's basically about reawakening your creativity and that everyone is a creative being and our lives are essentially our biggest, uh, creative outlets, right? So if you can tap in, yeah, we, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not creative, but it's just a story that we tell ourselves. And it's really important that we realize every day we're creating our life and our story. And so the more you can tap into your creativity, the more, possibilities you have at making the life you want to have. Anyways, it's a really great book. I highly recommend it to every single person in the world. I read it last year um, with a group of friends. It's really good to read with a group of friends because you have to go through this process and it keeps you accountable if you do it with other people. Yeah. Um, anyways, part of it is um, writing your morning pages and yeah, you're supposed to write three pages first thing. Sometimes I don't have time to write all three, but I'll try and write a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are like my biggest rituals. And then also I try and do like a smaller little breathwork meditation before I go to bed. Okay. And other than that, I really can't seem to find a good ritual to stick to because things are just changing so much all the time yeah. for me right now. Yeah. Totally. I feel that same way where like it's hard to get in a true routine of doing things every day. But, you know, like if you can, I, what I do is I wake up and I write down three goals that I have for the day. Um, oh, nice. Three things that I'm grateful for. And yep. then I have three mantras that I say to myself and I write mm -hmm. those down and I say them out loud to myself, mm -hmm. like a ton of energy to try mm -hmm. and, you know, like get myself all stoked up. Um, yeah. Do you know if the artist way is written by the same person that wrote the thinker's way by any chance? There is a good chance. Um, her name's Julia Cameron. I'm not sure who wrote The Thinker's Way. I'll have to look it up. I'll make a note of I it. I bet you they're in reference to each other, even if it's – or I bet you The Thinker's Way is in reference to The Artist's Way, one way or the other. Because I'm reading um, that right now, and it is totally a way to – this is by John Chaffee, apparently. Okay. But um, it, he has you get a journal and work through stuff as well. Yeah, so, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Totally, very I, similar. I also, yeah, and I also, I really like what you said about the gratitude thing because I always, I forgot to mention that I always end before I like resume real life. I always end my meditations or whatever with 
counting a couple of things that I'm really stoked on. And sometimes they're like material things. Sometimes I'm like, I just really love my truck because yeah. it's taking me so <laughs> many cool places and it really makes me happy. And, um, I think, you know, it's okay to like be super grateful for different material things that you have the privilege to have, you know, but yeah, yeah. the gratitude thing is so key to like making you feel happy about life. It's amazing. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Gratitude. Yeah, if you, if you don't have gratitude, I don't think you're going to go very far in, no. in any aspect of life. I know. Shifting gears, what's, uh, what's your favorite part about skiing? Why, like, obviously you've chosen to dedicate your life to it. So why? What's the reason mm-hmm. behind it? And I know that you... It's like super integral to your family. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love if like you'd talk a little bit about your family and and that as well in it, if you could. Yeah, I think uh, for me and my family and so many of us skiers, skiing is like it's almost like a worldview or a religion. Yeah, like it's the lens through which we view life and we practice certain uh it's like skiing is like a practice almost it's almost like a religion I think for a lot of us and so for my family skiing was just the way which we viewed life like everything revolved around skiing and same with me to this day like I don't know what my life would look like without skiing it's been the vehicle that has led me to learn a lot of things about myself And to be able to travel and see the world. And it's given me a lot of opportunities. And (laughs) and it's been, like, I can't think of life without it. But at the same time, it has created a lot of, I always wonder if there's other things out there too. Um, So I would say I keep skiing because it has been my, I don't know, it's, it's like the, like, the lens or the frame through which I view everything in life. And so everything is filtered through skiing, like how I meet people or how I view the world, how I want to improve myself, like noticing certain aspects of myself that I want to work on. A lot of times I notice them come up through my skiing. Um, and I think in that way, my family all kind of shares that. And it's this unspoken understanding of like that we, yeah, I don't know how to put it any better than it's almost like a religion or a worldview that we all share. So there's like these unspoken, um, common beliefs about life that are shared through skiing, if that makes any sense. Oh yeah, totally. I I think, you know, like when you, when I'm around someone that understands me, it's someone who views it, the world through that same worldview. Yeah. It's crazy. And like, it was like when I, Lexi DuPont was my first interview and I had never met her in person and like there's just this instantaneous connection that we had because we could relate to each other yeah because the mindset and uh yeah that that world view was so similar that yeah it was relatable and it was like instantaneously having community yeah exactly Um, and I think that's what we um really miss, especially in the United States, I think. And there's all this really interesting work or research being done on addiction and how every single case of addiction stems from a lack of sense of community. And I think there's this, as you know, we've become this um, technological screen staring society and world, you know, everything's becoming globalized. Like we're kind of losing that intimate community and intimate connection on a regular basis. And I think we really miss that in ways that we don't even fully comprehend. And so having things like our skiing tribe or our skiing community is way more powerful than we realize, you know, that, that just instant connection is like a really basic human need. Yeah. And I think having, being out with people that you truly can trust, I think, you know, part of what we've lost in this global society that's kind of the direction that we're heading is trust in others. Yeah. Because there's no real true need 
to tr uh, to trust others or to be trustworthy in some aspects because you can go out, you can find another job, you can find another person as a friend, you can find all these things. So thing, uh, friends, items, jobs, they become uh, dispensable. Yeah. And in skiing, like if you're out there with someone who thinks that you're dispensable you're not going to be skiing with them. No, you know, there's no <laughs> yeah. actual, like, there's not a connection. And so you're, you're, you'd feel it and then you'd gravitate away from it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's like the, the recognition of the importance of trust and also vulnerability, like being seen and knowing someone sees you for who you are, what you bring to the table. And like you, there's no space for like, I don't know, not lies, but yeah, just what you said about the, the trust part, I think is so key. Like we don't have the spaces to have that full trust and full vulnerability and safe places to do that as much anymore. So yeah, I like what you said. Definitely. And like, there's no room out on the mountain for, I think, false egotism, or, no. you know, thinking no, that and you're better or bigger than the mountain or the group or anything. Yeah. And if you do sense that someone is like that, it's really apparent in that setting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It's like uh, an elephant in the room that you can't yeah. ignore for sure. Like, oh, that guy. Yeah, totally. yeah, he's, he's all about himself, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. It becomes obvious. But I like that. I like that the mountains do keep us humble. Yeah. Totally. Mm -hmm. What do you do in the summers for like off season training? I know we kind of talked a little bit about how you didn't spend as much time as you wanted to at home. So I'm not sure if you had like a routine that you were following this summer or if it was like get a workout in here or there. Or, yeah, yeah so kind what, of. <laughs> what was it? What was it like for you? And what is it you know maybe normally like versus the difference between um, the past and this summer? Cause it's completely different for you. Yeah. Well, you know, the past five years I've been really traveling a lot in the summers and that's one thing that I've really struggled with. A route that is one routine that I have had a hard time finding and locking down is like the exercise and workout routine. That I think the hardest thing to, especially cause what the tools that you have available are always changing and so ideally you could just do body weight workouts wherever you are, but you don't always have the motivation to do that, especially if you're tired from traveling. So that's actually something that I have a really hard time with that I think the injury helped with a little bit is just knowing that it's possible to find a routine that works for you and carry it wherever you go, but it definitely requires you to dig deep and want it. And so this summer I got the t little time that I was home, I got really into downhill mountain biking, which is so fun. Oh yeah. Totally in love. I'm like, Oh my gosh, how did I not <laughs> find this out until now? But anyway, so I'm super hooked on that. But, um, so that's like my new passion, like little hobby, but, um, I biked a lot more this summer than I ever have before. I kind of feel like my um, in life, I go through phases of different sports so far, and I'm not sure which one I'll end up really settling on, but mountain biking is a new one. And that's, so I love, you know, also just like cross country biking, getting your heart rate up and, uh, getting like, have like sweating, getting your cardio, getting some strength in. And so I kind of try to do as much as I can outside to stay fit because I'm more motivated and energized. But I also really like incorporating in like yoga and Pilates. Like if I'm traveling in different cities, just like the mind body app is a really awesome app if you travel a lot, because it just looks up all these close facilities where you are like, you're like, I want to do yoga. And so it brings up all the yoga studios and their schedules and you can like book right there on the app. So that is something that I regularly use when I'm traveling and that's super nice. But, um, also my boyfriend just turned me onto the Nike fitness app and that's amazing because you can, it's basically like choose your own adventure and based on wherever you're at, whatever equipment you have access to and their workouts are just unbelievably awesome, whether it's from like really easy mobility stuff or like I only have 30 minutes and I want to get my ass kicked, <laughs> like, or, you know, whatever they'd have these, it's like, they've done a really, really good job. So I kind of haven't found one thing that works. I kind of pull from a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, totally. And piece together your own program that 
works for you. Yeah, pretty um, much. In addition to the fitness and everything, what uh, do you have a specific diet? Have you done like uh, experimentation with any diets or you know nutritional? Like I experimented with a ketogenic diet. If you know, yeah. How did that work? That. Um, I really liked it up until like I would have to eat carbs before I was working out. Uh huh. But I knew that I was gonna burn the glucose, and then after that, like. There were times when I was running and I w- had ran, like I ran like eight miles in an hour, which was the fastest I've ever run eight miles <laughs> for sure. And I felt like I could just keep running. Like I just uh-huh. felt like I could just run for, I felt like I could force gump it for, Sick. you know, Amazing. forever. And that was awesome. But then there were also days that I would get up and I would, or like I would go for a run and I would not. I was like sluggish. I did not Uh want to do anything. So it was kind of hit or miss for me. And then there wasn't any like any markers that would tell me that it was going to be an amazing (laughs) day or just kind of like luck of the draw. Like, I wonder what I'm going to feel like today when I go and try and do this. So interesting. um, Yeah, that was a little bit weird. And um, but overall, I really liked it. It's something that I. What I really liked about it was finding the discipline in mm-hmm. my eating to um, to hold such a rigorous uh, diet because, you know, you can't have any carbohydrates and carbohydrates right. are everywhere. Right. You know? It, yeah. Yeah. Like it's almost impossible to stay away from them. Yeah. Totally. Like even vegetables freaking have yeah (laughs) yeah yeah, i know um yeah i know a lot of my friends have um, been experimenting with the ketogenic diet recently and i've been curious i know it's been it's really good i think if you are struggling to like lose weight that you know you don't need i know a lot of friends that have like gotten kind of down to the weight that they feel really good at but other than that i don't know if like long-term sustainability how it's been working but uh Yeah. I mean, diet is so huge. You know, what you put in your body is everything. And that's what I find really challenging with traveling a lot is, um, it's really hard to consistently get to maintain one diet traveling. Uh, and so I try and like, I've been recently taking, you know, Hana one, um, which is a botanical supplement, and I really like that. And they've also, they make this ashwagandha, which is another root that's an adaptogenic yep. um, herb essentially. And so that between those two, I think it helps my body deal with stress. And cause I can't fully cut out, or I mean, I could, but I hesitate to fully cut out like gluten or dairy because, you know, you go to a place like Kosovo and you have no (laughs) option of not eating that stuff unless you bring all of your own food, which is really challenging too, if you're just going to be gone for two months, you know? So for me, it's really important when I'm at home, I eat really healthy and all organic. I really like having a good smoothie in the morning as well as a little bit of protein. Um, and I, when I'm at home, I eat super healthy And then when I go on the road, it's important that I can kind of eat anything. So I haven't gone on like a diet where I fully have cut out anything really, but I don't eat a lot of, I eat as little gluten as I can. And I don't really eat that much dairy either. And I feel better like that. Also sugars. I used to be a major sugar aholic, like crazy candy addict. And I loved it. That was my vice for sure. And I've cut that, which is really good. I still haven't cut out alcohol all the way, but. I would like to. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I don't have the answers, but I do know that I feel so much better if I regularly eat fresh organic stuff and kind of, um, really choose my, I can't go without meat. I've tried that and it, I don't know, maybe I just wasn't doing it properly, but for me, a a bit of protein every day is like, I makes me feel so much better and have so much more energy. So and I know you have to like really make sure you're getting enough of the right things if you're going to do that. But yeah, I don't know. It was, I did not feel good 
at all. I actually got, that was the only time that I've ever really felt like really depressed or anxious. And I started seeing a nutritionist because I just was for environmental reasons, was trying to eat no meat. And when I saw this nutritionist, she was like, have you been, have you, do you eat a lot of meat? Have you cut out meat recently? And I was like, actually, yeah. And so she prescribed like a certain amount of meat and then also deep belly breathing uh, for 20 minutes every morning. And because essentially what, uh, what happens if your body is malnourished is it kicks you into like a, a stressed, um, like a, it puts you into fight or flight mode. So if you're not getting enough energy, it like kicks into, it kicks your body into like this, yeah, stress mode essentially where it's like, I'm not getting enough food. And so it creates this cycle where your, um, sympathetic nervous system is like over engaged. And so between eating more meat and then deep belly breathing, which activates your parasympathetic nervous system for 20, if you do it for 20 minutes, um, and the way she had me test it, she was like, okay, take a deep breath. And so I took a deep breath and I took it all with my chest and shoulders. Like if you, when you take a deep breath, if you, um, if you create all the space by pulling your shoulders up and, and expanding your chest, it means you're basically in fight or flight mode. And that's why so many people when they're stressed have tight shoulders as you're constantly doing that every time you breathe. And when you're fully relaxed and out of that fight or flight mode, if you take a deep breath, it comes all the way from your stomach and it's much deeper. And so you can kind of signal to your body to like go come out of fight or flight mode by 20 minutes of belly breathing. So if I'm really stressed out and I've been traveling a lot or maybe like really stressful days in the field, um, at night, but especially in the mornings, I'll do 20 minutes of deep belly breathing and I feel so much better afterwards. So anyways, I kind of went on a tangent, but, um, it made me think about how so many people in the world are malnourished and uh, the like depression and anxiety rates that are going on right now. And I was like, I feel like there's probably a bit of correlation there. Yeah, totally. I love all of what you just said. I worked with a guy who uh, is like pretty much the inventor of reflexology if you've ever uh-huh. heard of it yeah and um you know wow. he he gave me some ways to reset my uh parasympathetic parasympathetic nervous system in even quicker ways than that oh, okay um so like what he so like when you go into fight or flight or uh, fight or flight mode you your hands will uh, tense up, your yep. feet will get flat and you'll yep. tend to, you know, skiers know this best. You tend to lean back. You're, <laughs> um, you're yeah. basically getting ready to run your, yep. um, you know, the, that part of the shoulder that you're talking about will lock up and yep. you won't be able to move your head left or right because you're facing what's happening or you're, yep facing the other direction and going yeah. um, and uh, what's the other thing oh um your tongue will uh i believe it goes to the roof of your mouth when you're in a fight or flight state of mind mm-hmm. but what mm-hmm. he would have me do is he'd have me um pinch my tongue in between my teeth put my head like 10 degrees to the left or right open my hands all the way, let my shoulders fall down my back and open, um, like my toes. Uh huh. And then take a deep breath and like basically feel like I'm being loved by the universe. Uh huh. And, um, that was actually something when I first got into big mountain competitions, it was something that I would do every time while I was in the gate beforehand to nice. relax myself to like yeah. get into that flow state where I wasn't reactive, I was active. That's amazing. Yeah, so. because um I when I went to this um Red Bull camp um last year, it was called Performing Under Pressure and you know, they dropped I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars on this camp and there was only nine athletes. Um and there was probably like 40 or so like um not employees or whatever, but people essentially putting on the camp everywhere from like Delta force, 
um, like Navy SEALs and um, Cirque du Soleil trainers and performers. And essentially this whole thing was about how to help you perform under pressure. And so the first bit of the camp was about learning physiologically what fear does to your body. And like you were saying, you know, you, your hands tense up, like blood shunts away from your extremities. And so you kind of learn all these ways that when, like you just said, when you're in a, a reactionary phase, instead of like a actionary phase that you just don't have as good of control over your bodily functions. And, you know, when you're performing at a high level, obviously the better you can understand it and work with it, the better you can perform. And so it's funny what you just said, like Red Bull put on this huge camp on doing all these things to help us understand when we're getting triggered and when we're like living in this kind of fear mode and how to snap out of it. And it was funny because a lot of the, you know, so they have, they had us like doing these different crazy relays where we're we're like, they taught us, you know, how to assemble these AK 47s. And so like part of the, one of the days was like, you had to run up to your gun and it would be disassembled in different ways. You'd have to reassemble it. And then as soon as you got it reassembled, you'd be, this guy would yell at you, like what targets you had to hit in different orders. So you'd have to listen to his instructions And so it was accuracy and you had to like run. So your heart rate is up. And meanwhile, the whole time there's like CO2 grenades going off. So you're getting really like stimulated Mm -hmm. auditorially because it's just like bang, bang, bang. You're getting yelled at and your heart rate's up. And so basically they're just trying to create like a really stressful environment where you had to think on your feet. And they were, you know, they had given us different techniques to try that some like this, like the, um, sports psychologist for like the giants, I think was there. And he's just this amazing guy. And it was funny to me because it was all these, like the latest and greatest scientific technology was like meditation, breath work, (laughs) mantra, like visualization, right? All these things. I'm like, wait, people have been doing this for thousands of years. And now you're like proving it in the lab that those are like the most effective things we can do. So it was pretty funny. Um, because it's so it's such ancient knowledge on how to be the best human you can be and perform at the highest level. And it was just funny that it was like this really fancy camp that basically <laughs> just and like the trick that you just said, you know, of like resetting your nervous system, like amazing. That's what we all should do, you know. And so actually I just had a question when you said um pinch your tongue between your teeth, what do you mean by that? Like uh just place it in between like in the front of your mouth in between your top and bottom teeth and like not like biting down hard mm-hmm. but just um basically I think oh so I think the reason why he had me do that was because you stop breathing through your mouth and you automatically start breathing through your nose when you're in a fight or flight state of mind mm-hmm. so it forces you to keep your mouth open, which forces you to breathe through your mouth somewhat, Uh I believe is why. I'll I'll hit him back up because I haven't worked with him in like five or six years now. But Mm -hmm. basically, yeah, just like, uh, you know, resting your teeth on the, like the tip of your tongue. Basically what you were just doing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Sick. I love it. I love that. I'm going to try that now. It's pretty cool, and yeah. the more that you do it, the more just the better off that you you know it it works for you. Yeah. Um, but it's something that I yeah any time that I f- am like have the adrenaline start going to the point where I'm getting a physiological reaction, like if I start to get um. Like, you ever feel like your spine starts to, like, get the shivers sometimes? Yeah, yeah. Like I'll when, get really shaky. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, that, but, like, when it's overwhelming you, and it's just, yeah. like, um, yeah. <laughs> when I, when that happens, is, like, I can, it's, like, automatic control. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. yeah. So. It's so amazing, hey? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Sick. I know. Cause it's great. Like I was, I was suffering like crippling anxiety and it, I, if I was a different person, I probably would have been on like prescription, like Western medication, but I w- I was trying to deal with it just through meditation, but it was so, it was like, I was just in this circle where I would, I'd do meditation. I'd feel better for a little bit. And then I would find myself like walking around in circles, just like so anxious, not able to think clearly. And like, it was r- sucked really bad. And it was amazing how the belly breathing and kind of taking myself out of that just through the breath was so powerful. And I love that there's something that we can do like quicker when we need to. Yeah, totally. 
And the yeah. more, like, since you, like you were saying in the beginning of the podcast, since you have practiced it and it is in routine, it'll just come so much faster for you. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's awesome. I can't wait to hear how it works for you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Definitely. So you started to talk about the environment and, you know, changing your diet for the environment and what's going on, you know, with the environment, with what we just had happen a month ago with two hurricanes and fires in the Pacific Northwest and just like everything going on. What is like, what's your stance on it? And what is something that you think that anyone could put into practice to help us move towards a situation where instead of like the way that I see it right now, maybe 10 generations will survive us and I'm not okay with that happening. Like yeah. that's just not okay. So part yeah. of my mission in life is to, you know, allow for a thousand generations to survive us. I'll never mm -hmm. know whether that ever was accomplished or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I can at least put it out there and try and inspire as many people as possible to share that goal. So, yeah. you know, what, what do you think, what do you think about it? And then, you know, what are the practices that you think that people can easily incorporate to just become more conscious and aware and do their best? Yeah. Um, I think the first well, I just, yeah, just so to start out with, I definitely think that we're undergoing the most massive um, undertaking that humanity has maybe ever had to do with um, the severe impacts that we're seeing from climate change. And I personally believe that it's definitely at least majorly human influenced and that we would be silly to pretend like what if we change our ways, it won't matter or that we shouldn't because we're heading down this path. I think we need to really restructure our system and really look at where we're at and how we relate to the planet and being able to interact with it in a sustainable way. And like, you know, the planet's going to be fine. Yeah. Mother Earth will keep going and it's going to look a lot different, but we're the ones at risk, you know. So keeping that in mind, I think is also paramount. But the number one thing I think that's really important is for anyone who maybe has been watching all this go down like myself and is feeling kind of doom and gloom or hopeless, or especially when you look at the changes that need to be made and how massive they are, not losing hope is I think the biggest thing that you can do. And for me, the way I do that is regularly get outside. Um, and even if you're in a city, like going for a walk in a park, there's so many studies coming out on how important it is to get outside in like, or, and surround yourself in nature every day, even if it's just a city park, like it does so many things to reset our chemistry, um, that it's pretty amazing. Uh, some of the work they've been coming out with, but so number one, don't lose hope, get outside. It will help maintain, you know, positive feelings and state of mind. Um, and then the, yeah, the largest actual contributor to green uh, human, Emit, emitted greenhouse gases is the agricultural industry and like the cattle industry. So cutting out, uh, cutting out beef as much as you can. And especially if you're going to eat beef, trying to make it, well, all meat, but you know, like grass fed, humanely raised obviously, but, yeah. um, trying to eat less beef was something I can't, when I realized, okay, I can't cut out meat, being a lot more conscious of where the meat that I was eating was coming from and grass fed is like a really big thing, but yeah, less beef and, uh, really trying when I travel to like research different, like organic locally, um, uh, sourced restaurants. Cause yeah. I have to eat out a lot. And totally. so, you know, a lot of times when you're traveling all the time, you like, you don't have a say in where the meat comes from. But if you do a little bit of homework and you're like, Oh sick, this place like has the right, um, you know, like fundamental morals that we need to be supporting. Yep. That's a big thing. So that kind of brings me into my second point, which is choosing how we spend our money is really important right now because, um, we can do everything in our day-to-day -day life, like try and drive less or recycle or use energy efficient light bulbs. And all those things are great, but using our voices, both calling our senators and you know, Congress people and telling them what's important to us is really important and using our voices 
monetarily is really important because the changes that need to be made are going to come from uh, businesses making them at this point. Like politician, when I've gone with to all these different like climate change symposiums or Washington DC, like they care about their constituents, but also ultimately money talks. And so helping small businesses or businesses that are doing the right thing grow. And then, um, using, you know, your dollars to say, these are the kinds of, uh, values that we want our corporations to have and having supporting corporations that are speaking out and are using like their money to support the right, uh, political endeavors or actions is like super, super crucial. So totally like Patagonia and OR and speaking out against the national parks. And, you know, with that being, you know, I think Patagonia was ultimately the catalyst for OR moving to Denver this next year because, you know, they, they spoke out and yeah, that's awesome. Um, in relation to, you know, getting outside, something that I'm trying to do, I feel like, uh, and don't get me wrong in this, but uh, tourists and the main chunk of where the ski economy uh, is driven, or like the, the main chunk of money that comes in through the ski economy is through tourism. Yeah. Which tourists have no real uh, reason to look at what you and I do and think that it's attainable or anything that they would want to do in any right. way, shape or form. Right. So I've started a company called Academy of Skiing, which is like an online resource for people to learn how to ski. And I think it oh, kind cool. of like shortcuts um, some of the things like it, it, anything from like, this is how you walk in ski boots because that's so foreign, you know, like yeah, it, totally. it's so hard for people to like, this is how you skate. This is how you pull. And then I have like tutorials on like, this is how you throw a 360 because, you know, certain people are going to want to push their limits and boundaries and, you know, kind of relating back to how we were saying it's like a, a worldview. It's a, it's a venue for us to express ourselves and, and it's a venue for anyone to express themselves if they understand and they don't limit their creativity and they realize mm-hmm. that they can be anyone that they want to be if they put their heart to it. Yeah. And um, so, you know, ultimately my goal for Academy of Skiing is to get people who either wouldn't normally enjoy it because they didn't have the right gear, the right knowledge, the right, you know, the right circumstances Mm -hmm. to, um, like, uh, encourage having passion for the sport and get them out there. Because I feel like, you know, for me and for you and for so many other people skiing, it just makes it so obvious that we need to take care of the world because we get to spend so much time out in it yeah and we get to spend so much time you know hiking in the mountains and being around these animals that most people only see on national geographic or you know yeah and um yeah it's true i mean i think it's really hard to have a fundamental desire to like protect the environment or the place we live if you don't don't have like a really good relationship with it where you get to experience it and see how amazing it is. You know, it's like, and that's what blows me away when I, cause you know, recently, especially for like different sponsor requests and stuff like that, I've been spending a lot of time in cities and like just how many people never get to experience the outdoors or even realize the important, realize like how good it feels to just take a walk in the park. Like it is so far outside of most people's daily lives that it's mind blowing. Like, cause that, you know, the majority of the world's population lives yeah. in cities yeah. and where you're just walking on concrete all the time. Right. Yeah. It's wild. It's, it's crazy. For yeah. Sure. And I, and I do, that's like something that I've been thinking about a little bit too, is just the fact that it's increasingly becoming like a privilege to have access to the outdoors, you know, like it either requires being born there already or having a bit of money to get there if you don't live there. Yep. Or sacrificing comfort, other comforts, which, you know, I don't, I think you and I can easily sacrifice those comforts, but if you're used to living in a city and then you move to like Crested Butte where I live, where there, you know, the grocery store is, 30 miles away and it's super expensive and you know like yeah yeah there's just like 
there's a lot of factors that make it increasingly harder or less incentivized to be there. Yeah. So I don't know. And I think we all have different like purposes or things that causes that resonate that we want to work on. But I think that's a really, that's one I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I really respect people who like take time to make it possible, especially for kids to get out there and plant the seeds of like, Hey, look how amazing this is. And this is something we want to try and make possible for everyone, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, I recently got in touch with a guy who runs the color runs, um, like the five K's where they throw the colored powder on you. And yeah, yeah. He's all into I just got into speed flying um recently. Oh, sick. And he's into the like the air sports like base jumping and wingsuiting and all that and he's getting um orphaned and foster children. He's starting a camp in San Diego called Freedom Land and he's teaching them how to grow their own food. There's like a rock climbing uh place that sick. they're building and then he's trying to inspire people through like the air sports and the extreme sports but like getting out in nature and like um being one with the elements I think is how I would relate it because you know Mm -hmm. skiing is like being one with water but you know frozen water and like yeah after having done you know like almost 40 speed flights now like it's totally being one with the air for sure and um yeah I think you know anyone who's out there who I think we all have an influence on kids and more of an influence than we ever know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I I have so much respect for Jamie and what he's doing. Um, It's called Just – what is it? He just changed the name of his foundation, but I think it's called – oh, it's Just Care More if you want to check it out at all. Cool. It's pretty awesome. They've got, like, unicorn socks and stuff that they're selling (laughs) right now. It's pretty awesome. (laughs) Sick. <coughs> but, write that down. Sick. What? Um. So speaking of like kids and the world and where you know where we're at right now, if you could have one significant impact in the world, what would it be? Uh, I think it would, well, that's like lifelong (laughs) question. Right. Um, yeah. Um, but I guess sometimes the best things you can do is just what comes off the top of your head. Um, if I could have one significant impact, I think it would be that, um, letting, being able to make everyone that I encounter feel loved and worthy and able to make whatever changes that they wanted to make in the world, yeah. you know, like to inspire people's beliefs in themselves and the good of people and nature and life itself, I guess. Yeah. And it doesn't, that none of this has to be your final answer. You can change it at any, <laughs> <laughs> at any point. I'll change it in five minutes. No. Yeah. no, but that was the first thing that comes up. Yeah, totally. I love that, you know, empowering others is just, you know, so important. And, you know, once you get in the routine of empowering yourself and practicing that, like, self-validation, I think um, that's kind of the next step in the in the progression is empowering yeah. others. So. Yeah, exactly. And I think something I think about a lot too, that there's a lot of talk getting thrown around of like inspiring others or empowering others. And I resonate or I like all of those concepts, but I also, when I, when I speak about them or think about them to me, like of utmost importance also is like, I don't necessarily, I realize that I want to resonate with others is the most important because I want to find things that other people are, that are like, Ooh, yeah, I, f- I feel that. And I like that moves me as well because I think I, I realized I didn't like saying I want to inspire others. Or I want to empower others just 
alone like that because it made me feel like there was a lack of humility in there, you know, like, yep. like all of a sudden I've reached some tier and I'm better than you and I'm going to show you the way to awesomeness, <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Because that's not how I feel at all. I feel like the older I get, the more I realize I don't know and the more humble I become. And so uh, like throughout life, I want to find things that, that help move all of us together, you know, not like not like the the older I get, the more I feel like I've figured it out and want to share that with others, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, totally. And I love yeah. that you make that distinction because when you say the word resonate, when I think of the word resonate, I literally kind of think of like um like if I'm resonating with someone, there's like a vibration that's inside me that yeah. feels like it's matching someone else's. Yeah, And there's no exactly. way for me to describe it other than that. Yeah. But, yeah, exactly. So I've been trying to use that word instead of like, at least in my dialogue, I've been trying to replace like inspire, especially with resonate, because I think everyone knows what resonate means, but it's not as commonly used. And I do feel like sometimes um, the word inspire can be either used wrong or taken wrong or I don't know. So yeah, that's just been something that's been on my mind recently. Well, there you have it, folks. The first half of the interview with Angel Collinson. This interview actually went so long that I'm going to split it into two. I appreciated this conversation so much and hope that you guys get a takeaway as much as I did. Uh, as always, don't forget to go check out our sponsors, Grass Sticks and IFA Prowear grasssticks.com three s's in the middle and ifa-prowear.com two bamboo products that are amazing uh, encouraging sustainability encouraging taking care of the environment and they are both very durable the long underwear and underwear is super soft and the poles are comparable to nothing that i have ever skied with so if you have any friends or if you'd like to check out my free ebook on learning how to ski and get emails from me go ahead and check out www.academyofskiing.com yeah.